So my today's topic is interpreting urodynamics in pediatric uh, neurogenic bladder uh, patients. I'm going to extend it for functional disorders patient also, which are closely uh, mimicking neurogenic bladder. So I will be briefly discussing the basic physiology of low urinary tract function and its neuro association, and then we'll be uh, taking you through to the uh, assessment of filling and voiding phase, the final interpretation before concluding. So as we all know, uh, the filling phase is marked by uh, inhibited detuser function and uh, overactive and active function of bladder neck as well as ex uh, external sphincter. And it is augmented by uh, excitatory bladder to urethra reflexes and inhibitory urethra to bladder reflexes. The voiding function uh, includes a switch, uh, which leads to relaxation of sphincters and contraction of detrusor to completion of uh, voiding. And it is also augmented by a switched inhibitory uh, uh, bladder to urethra and urethra to bladder reflex, secondary reflexes. Now, the, on the right side, there is a uh, brain and spine diagram. There are four dots on it. The first dot denotes uh, pon pons because pontine maturation center is the seat of this uh, paradoxical switch. And the second point is a T6 spinal level, which corresponds to approximately T89 of vertebral level, which marks the start of sympathetic outflow. So a lesion which is above this point will actually lead to decentralization of sympathetic outflow also. Then this third point is the S1 or above. So any lesion which is above this point will lead to extent, uh, will lead to decentralization of parasympathetic uh, pathway only. Then there is the fourth dot, which actually uh, denotes the damage of S234 or uh, even the peripheral uh, damage to S234. So all these things have their implication. And we should also remember that there is reflexive voiding till four or five years of age with less inhibition and uh, voiding typically in high pressure as such. So what is the implication of these four dots? Uh, any lesion which is above this will lead to detrusor overactivity, but uh, a coordinated sphincter. Any lesion above the second point will lead to detrusor overactivity as well as hyperactive sphincters, both a, a bladder neck and external uh, thing. Any lesion which is above the third point will lead to detrusor overactivity as well as coordinated internal, but uh, 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 non-coordinated external sphincter. Any lesion which damages the S234, whether it is uh, within the spine or outside the spine, it will reduce the, markedly reduce the detrusor activity uh, and it will also cause sphincters to be partially tight, partially relaxed and non-responsive. Now, the interpretation of urodynamics is uh, divided into two phases, filling phase and voiding phase. In the filling, I'm including the stress phase also when uh, done. So we will look at sensations, we will look at detrusor overactivity, the compliance, which is the rubberiness of bladder, leak points like detrusor leak point, or overactive leak point or uh, stress leak point. Then if the EMGs are done, how to interpret them. Then if urethral pressure, uh, uh, I will not discuss urethral uh, pressure because that will lengthen the presentation and it's very rarely done. Although it's a very useful investigation in my experience. Then uh, in uh, children, we should uh, most of the time combine uh, the urodynamics with either a video if we have available, or even an MCAG done separately also is sufficient. So the common neurogenic conditions like spinal dysraphism, sacral agenesis, or spinal tumor, spinal injury, cerebral palsy, are uh, various reasons of for having to perform urodynamics, or uh, the non-neurogenic causes which give rise to very uh, problematic uh, uh, to the child are Posterior valve after primary treatment of valves and dysfunctional voiding, which can even uh, present like Hinman syndrome, which is no less than uh, neurogenic bladder for upper tract damage. So during filling, we should mention uh, or notice at what rate the filling uh, was there. Now it should be five to ten percent of functional bladder capacity. How do we know whether by if the patient is on CIC or self voiding? We'll know by bladder diary. 
or we can uh, have an estimate like uh, for an infant it's 7 ml per kg or for more than one year old it's age plus one into 30 ml position of the patient should be uh, marked size of the catheter the smaller the better uh, we should note that uh, what size of catheter was used the smallest uh, systematic catheter dual lumen is about six french or alternatively equally effectively we can use two infant feeding tubes so let's say if you're using a five french feeding tube which are two it is not equal to 10 french obstruction because uh, you have to see consider the area not one dimension so actually it is about seven French uh, obstruction. So two feeding tubes is equal to using seven French uh, one tube and so on. In systometry, sensations uh, in adults particularly are important. Uh, the ICS recommends uh, filling first sensation, first desire to void, strong desire to void, and urgency for leak or pain should be marked separately. However, in children, particularly neurogenic bladder, it may not be practicable or the children are not toilet trained, like less than, typically less than five years of age, it is not practicable. The more important issues are bladder overactivity. So due to the overactivity, uh, if one uh, is noted, then we should mention other things. Like in the first graph, you see there is a, this third graph, the green graph is a P detrusor. There is a, a low amplitude repeated uh, overactivity. Uh, we should know at which volume it started. And the second graph you see, it was a high amplitude overactivity, which was associated with leakage. So whether leak was present, it should be noted. Now coming to compliance, which is possibly the most important parameter to look into uh, when we are uh, doing uh, any neurogenic bladder evaluation, because this is the single most factor which will uh, decide the risk for upper tracts. So in the first graph, you see uh, normal compliance means the volume is increasing without in much increasing the detrusor pressure. In the second graph, you see a clearly a poor compliance. The green graph is P detrusor. It continues to increase progressively as the filling is uh, going on. And uh, when this happens, we should stop the flow for at least one minute and see uh, whether the pressure detrusor was reduced. Because a poor compliance has two components. One component is active, which is by the tonus of detrusor, and it will respond to stopping the flow. The other part is because of the fixed loss of compliance, because of the collagen deposition. So this differentiation is important. Like in this uh, uh, example, you see that on stopping the flow, the P detrusor reduced from 55 to 43, but still it remained very high. And if the patient already has, is on anticholinergics or beta-3 blockers, there is very less hope for any conservative management. So he, will, he or she will possibly need a more aggressive management. Uh, on the contrary, this one, you see that the P detrusor had increased 36, but on stopping the flow for two minutes, it progressively reduced to 16, so more than 50% drop. And this is the patient uh, who will possibly respond to conserve more conservative management like uh, Botox or if the anticholinergics have not been given those ones. A normal compliance is more than 20 ml per centimeter of water, uh, and uh, high risk compliance for upper tract is less than 10 ml per centimeter of water. Then if the EMG is done, we should look at guarding reflex. Now guarding reflex is uh, any of the three upper graphs, a progressively increasing EMG activity on progressive filling. And it happens because of these active secondary bladder to urethra and urethra to bladder reflexes. Now if in a EMG, which is representative, means the EMG electrodes are properly placed by the side of anus as close to uh, that as possible, properly fixed, and the baby is not straining or crying, then the second, third, uh, the last three graphs do mention that uh, there is something wrong with the guarding reflex. So there can be a neurogenic or even functional component that you cannot say. Then uh, there comes leak point pressure. So these leak point pressures, mainly it is detrusor leak point pressure, which is a passive uh, urine leak during filling, where there is no active detrusor contraction or there is no straining or cuffing or sneezing. Now, higher that uh, leakage, or if the leak does not happen beyond 40 centimeter of water, it's a high risk situation for upper tract damage. And uh, in this particular case, we are correlating it with these uh, MCU films. Now, it's the same patient's uh, situation after augmentation cystoplasty. You see the compliance has markedly improved. The PDET max has reduced to less than 20. Uh, 
and the baby is still leaking at 20 centimeter water, which is a low risk situation for uh, this patient's upper tracts. And this can this will be managed accordingly. If if not by CIC, then uh, one may have to do an outlet uh, increasing procedure. Then abdominal leak point pressures are also important in which the provocation method in the, in the first uh, spike shows cuff, the second spike shows uh, uh, valsalva. So that should be noted and this will give some idea about how weak is the outlet. Now, coming to the voiding phase. So in patients in whom we expect uh, whom, are, whom are self voiding, uh, active voiding phase, in this we look at two components. So it's essentially finding a relation between pressure and flow. So we should know how much potential a particular detrusor have. So suppose, is this detrusor contracting strong enough so that the patient is able to pass urine to completion with or without an obstruction? So it is uh, in adults, it has been uh, defined as particularly males, detrusor contractility index with the formula given on the screen. The other uh, parameter uh, which this pressure flow study tells you is how much is the obstruction means how much is the resistance to flow this which is given as bladder outlet obstruction index. These two graphs the top one ICS and the bottom one uh, Schaefer nomogram they are uh, of great importance in when analyzing the adult uh, outflow. However, in children and it is given as a normal pressure normal flow a high pressure low flow or a low pressure low flow situation and uh, they are very well defined however in children they are not validated although uh, in our experience we find that uh, these are potentially valid but there is no study to prove that so that is why uh, when you have an apparent high pressure or normal pressure situation you should corroborate it with a separately done mcug or you should do a video urodynamics so now let us try to decipher one by one. So an apparent normal pressure, normal flow graph. You see in the filling phase, you have this detrusor overactivity and each of this activity, you see the increase in EMG. So this EMG is actually, we are teaching this uh, patient uh, oh, um, detrusor, uh, sorry, urge inhibition. So this patient had urgency and we asked the patient to do urge inhibition and see the urgency is improving. So that means during urodynamics, you can actually do a kind of biofeedback on EMG. And uh, you see that once the patient was giving command to volitional voiding, the patient did generate a good detrusor uh, pressure and voided with very good flow. In this, uh, as per adult parameters, it was unobstructed and good detrusor. In this high pressure, uh, low flow uh, situation, you see a good uh, uh, detrusor uh, relaxation during uh, the filling phase. And you see an obvious high pressure and uh, low flow situation with relaxation of sphincter. So this looks like a person who is neurologically intact and has some sort of an obstruction. Unless this was a young baby less than five years of age who are expected to void with the high pressure low flow. In this case, AG number was high, obviously, and detrusor was uh, contractility was good, more than 100. And uh, his MCU showed a bladder neck obstruction. But there is also a sphincter obstruction. So this is the limitation we have to interpret in the line light of clinical data. This is another situation in which you find uh, there is a poor compliance filling phase with the phasic detrusor contractions, irregular, persistent. And uh, towards the end, you see the, there are high amplitude uh, overactivity uh, and which is coupled with increased EMG activity. And one of these uh, overactivity became very high amplitude and uh, there was a equivalent increase in the uh, detrusor uh, contraction as well as the EMG and the patient voided a very small amount. In this case, there was a uh, obstructed AG number with weak detrusor. So an MCU correlate showed a uh, fointry appearance of bladder, grade five reflux, open bladder neck and non-opening sphincter, external sphincter. So this is a case of detrusor overactivity with DESD. Now, this is another case of high pressure low flow. This patient has uh, uh, severe overactivity. During filling phase, we can see the first two spikes. And then there was a third spike in which the patient attempted to pass urine. And uh, uh, there was an obvious obstruction because high pressure low flow is seen. 
But in the same patient, when we ask the patient, we give volitional uh, command to void, patient develops some contraction and then there were uh, two episodes of overactivity. But this time, they were lower amplitude and the flow was higher and it showed non-obstructive. So now which one uh, you go for it, whether this patient is obstructed or not, very difficult to say. So this case turned out to be a dysfunctional voider secondary to idiopathic overactivity long-standing. So you see that MCU shows in the first uh, first part, you see the bladder neck is not opening well. And in the second part, the bladder neck opened well, but the sphincter still is not opening well. So this patient was managed with uh, medications and pelvic flu relaxation. Is another situation you see this looks like obviously high pressure, then low flow and increase EMG activity. But if you look at the perspective, so this was actually high amplitude overactivity. We taught this patient uh, urge inhibition and the patient still kept on leaking, but ultimately was able to control. And on volitional command to void, the patient voided with fairly low pressure and excellent flow uh, as corroborated with the MCU also. So, Pressure flow relations are valid only for voluntarily initiated maturation. If the patient uh, is having overactivity and unless you give a voiding command well in advance, it is not a valid uh, uh, outflow relation and measurement. Now, what's the difference uh, in all of these four graphs? So if you have an intact pontine maturation center and all the nerves uh, peripherally, then you will, in presence of bladder neck obstruction, you will get high detrusor pressure because the detrusor is having to function against resistance. Whereas if the PMC is uh, excluded from the bladder, so what you will find, you will have a external sphincter non-relaxation and that uh, will give rise to high pressures, not the internal sphincter, as long as the lesion is below T6 level and that will be corroborated only by MCU. Beware of autonomic dysreflexia, which is a dangerous condition in patients who have high spinal lesions, particularly above T6 uh, spinal level. Now coming to a low pressure, low flow suspicion. So this first graph you, you see, the good compliance where fairly low uh, detrusor pressure during filling and the patient uh, on upon command of uh, voiding, the patient voided with low pressure, low flow situation. The AG number was an equivocal range and uh, bladder contractility index was almost normal, but somewhat low. And you see, you can see that EMG is relaxing during the voiding. Uh, this is another uh, uh, image of the same situation where you see that uh, the EMG is relaxing. There is low pressure when the flow is also low. So in this case, we should do an MCUG to find out whether there is any secondary obstruction or not, because by looking at the graph, you cannot say. This is the second situation in which, the, again, the P detrusor is uh, low only during filling, so good compliance, no overactivity, and the patient has voided with low pressure, low flow. But now you see the difference. The difference is in the voiding in the uh, detrusor pattern. You see it's more plateau pattern compared to the previous one. It is more of a bell shape, flattened bell shape pattern. Now, what is the uh, explanation? You see this. It was corroborated with the MCUG and you we found that external sphincter was not relaxing properly in this case. I will come to that explanation. Now, this is the third situation in which there is a poor compliance. This is a girl with uh, dysfunctional voiding and uh, there was no neurological correlate found, but this she had presented with hydroeutonephrosis, the elevated creatinine, urodynamics had revealed a poor uh, bladder compliance. She had already been taught pelvic flow relaxation uh, because of which she was able to empty her bladder completely. You can see that the end film period is up to 36 centimeter water, which is fairly high. But when she started voiding, there was a relaxation of pelvic floor with no straining and the pressure fell down and there was no obstruction. Now here, one question arises. Uh, what is the detrusor pressure? Is it 34? But actually, she did not raise the detrusor pressure beyond the end film period. So though actually, the detrusor pressure is almost zero but we don't know. So uh, we have to correlate with MCU. In this case, the MCU revealed that thickened trabeculated bladder, but a nicely open outlet. So this case was a, uh, of a poor compliance, but there was no problem with the outlet. Now, what's the difference between the uh, two uh, these three scenarios? 
in a diffuser under activity you will find that diffuser is not responding properly to even obstructed uh, outflow so you cannot uh, uh, know whether there is an obstruction or not but you know that there is diffuser uh, under activity now in these cases you will find a bell shaped diffuser pattern now this is our original research and first time uh, it has been reported by us from pgi chandigarh and uh, there is another publication uh, in the pipeline now in the other situation where the external sphincter is not relaxing properly so what is doing it is inhibiting the diffuser secondarily and that is also giving rise to diffuser under activity which is denoted by a flattened uh, diffuser uh, contraction curve now coming to a reflexic or atonic diffuser now that's a situation you should always remember that the diagnosis of a reflexic or atonic diffuser is based on clinical scenario because during voiding phase if the patient is unable to initiate uh, micturition reflex or if the patient is voiding by habit by straining you cannot say a reflexic uh, atonic you have to corroborate with clinical finding like in this situation you see that the, there is poor bladder compliance and the patient is not able to void by relaxation now this is a case of mening sacral meningomyelocele open meningomyelocele so we don't expect this patient to be able to void voluntarily so uh, in this case you can say this is atonic diffuser with poor diffuser compliance now coming to second scenario in this you see there is a flat line of period in filling here the voiding command was given and the patient is able to generate small amount of diffuser contraction but the patient is then voiding uh, trying to void by straining now in this case micturition reflex was generated which was very very weak but then it gave way to his habit of uh, straining to void now this is an elderly diabetic i uh, put up directly because in uh, purposefully to just give a differentiation that this is a case of severe diffuser under activity we cannot say whether it's obstructed or not but there is severe diffuser under activity and we should be careful about it now this is a third scenario now in this case you see the diffuser co compliance looks normal however there is a small rhythmic contraction kind of thing of diffuser the patient is voiding by uh, straining but able to empty the, uh, the bladder completely now this is a patient with augmentation cystoplasty in neurogenic bladder and uh, this patient this uh, uh, rhythmic diffuser contractions are actually the small bowel uh, rhythmic contractions so in this case we know that uh, this will not be able to uh, uh, void so it will not be able to initiate a micturition reflex so this training will denote uh, a reflexic uh, diffuser and this is that uh, patient on straining the patient is voiding this is no active diffuser contraction in this so finally urodynamics is the backbone of management of neurogenic bladder and even uh, functional uh, voiding dysfunctions where Uh, there is high risk for upper tract damage urodynamics questions must be formulated before getting the study done a proper quality control a proper performance which includes um, uh, making the baby making the child uh, uh, comfortable with the environment if the small baby who will cry during the study we should uh, place the catheter up front i mean beforehand and then uh, do the study later on so that the child has adjusted to the catheter sometimes small amount of sedative can be used but not uh, anesthetic and a proper interpretation is essential that way artifacts there are artifacts and limitations which should be taken into account and lastly we cannot lab label uh, a bladder as neurogenic bladder there is no diagnosis neurogenic bladder it neurogenic bladder is basically bladder bowel dysfunction because of neurogenic condition so neurogenic can only be labeled with proper clinical correlation on urodynamics you can only propose findings not label as a neurogenic or non neurogenic so thank you very much for patient listening and a time has come to uh, judicially use antibiotics um, in our practice we don't use antibiotics uh, systemically we always get the culture done if there is infection we treat it uh, uh, beforehand uh, before two days during the study in such cases we use uh, amikacin during in the filling fluid and we discharge them without any antibiotics thank you very much for patience